Okay, I'll go ahead and uh, make a preliminary introduction. So I'm Scott Lathrop. It's a pleasure to welcome you to today's ACM SIG HBC Education Chapter Webinar. Uh, today's topic is incorporating computation in the physics curriculum. Uh, this is going to be uh, first in a series of what we hope will be uh, webinars uh, talking about uh, the strategies and the challenges and the solutions and opportunities for incorporating computation into various uh, uh, curricula. Uh, we're pleased today to have uh, Dr. Larry Engelhart, uh, who's a professor of physics at Francis Marion University, and Dr. Richard Gass, who's the undergraduate program director for Department of Physics at the University of Cincinnati, joining us. Um, if you have questions, I'll encourage you to go ahead and uh, go into the chat space and uh, post your questions while our two presenters are presenting. Um, and I think what we'll do is let them both present and then we'll uh, open it up for a, a general Q&A for everyone who's on the call. Um, we would love to capture uh, names and emails of uh, those of you that have joined the call. Uh, so if you're willing to share your email, uh, please send it to myself, Scott Lathrop. That way we can uh, follow up with you uh, with any uh, further information and suggestions. With that then, again, it's a pleasure to have you all join us. And uh, Larry, I think we'll go ahead and let you kick it off if you're ready. Great, sounds good. Uh, I'm sharing a slide right now. Is everyone able to see a yep, slide indeed. that I'm sharing? Yep. Okay, great. Um, so I'll talk about two things. Um, the first thing I'll talk about is pickup, give uh, a little overview of, of what pickup is and a status report of where pickup is at. And uh, then I'll also talk a little bit about a sophomore level computational physics course that I'm teaching. So those are the two things uh, that I'll talk about. So uh, pickup, for those who don't know, is the Partnership for Integration of Computation into Undergraduate Physics. Uh, we currently have an NSF grant uh, that is, has just finished four years uh, into the grant. Um, these are the, the PIs on that particular grant. Uh, myself, Danny Caballero, Marie Lopez del Puerto, uh, Kelly Roos, and Bob Hilborn. Um, so I'll tell you sort of where we're at with pickup, uh, which again is the Partnership for Integration of Computation into Undergraduate Physics. Uh, so the title of the current grant proposal is Integrating Computation into Undergraduate Physics, Faculty Development for Community Transformation. So this is really a faculty development project. Um, and this is just some text from the actual proposal right here. And the couple things I want to stress is the faculty development workshops that we've been doing, uh, as well as the materials that uh, are, have been produced and are being produced. Um, and you can access those online at the Pickup website, which is uh, compadre.org slash pickup. Um, so you can go ahead and go there right now um, and look at some of the things that are available there. Um, so I'll show you a bit of detail about each of those two things. Um, for the faculty development workshops, uh, there have been a, a series, these are week-long residential workshops that we've done uh, each of the last four summers. And in the proposal, we said we'd have 24 faculty participants each summer that would come to these uh, faculty development workshops. So the first one was in 2016. Um, so this is the participants that we had there in the middle of the summer in 2016. And then each consecutive year, this is what we had for the number of participants um, at those faculty development workshops. Um, so we far exceeded the number of participants that we said we were going to have uh, in the proposal. Uh, here's a picture from this most recent summer. So we have this big group of people. And I should stress here that we're getting uh, physics faculty to come for a week and uh, live somewhere and focus on working on what, how they're going to integrate computation into, the, into their courses. Um, so this is a lot of people. So we've been really happy about that. Uh, this is where those people have come from. This is the group that we had in 2016. And this is 2017, 2018, and 2019. Um, so we've gotten them from all over the country. Uh, each of these dots here represents one or more people. Uh, in a lot of cases, there were more than one person who came from the same institution. We encouraged departmental teams to come since that was going to help uh, with buy-in at their institution and to get the integration of computation actually happening. Um, so we've got people from all over the country here. This most recent summer, we actually started charging a registration fee for this, which we hadn't been doing on the first three summers. 
Um, and the number of participants still went up. So one might reasonably ask the question, what happened going from 2016 to 2019? Uh, and the answer is that we were able to get the word out uh, about what was happening. So we've done uh, workshops at lots and lots of different meetings uh, of the American Association of Physics Teachers and the American Physical Society. Uh, we've also done some workshops at uh, various other locations. We actually just recently had the second annual uh, pickup workshop that uh, took place in the greater Chicagoland area. Um, so we've gotten the word out through lots of different half-day workshops uh, going on around the country. Um, and so that's about the, the FDWs, the Faculty Development Workshops. Um, and then I'm gonna tell you and show you a little bit about the Pickup website. Um, so actually for me, the, um, let me see if I can move it. The, the little thing that shows faces is, oh, there you go, I moved it to the bottom. Um, I'm not sure, you, it doesn't, where I have the thing showing faces doesn't affect where you have faces, right? You can still see the slides, is that correct? Slide, but no pictures. No okay, pictures. good, yeah, okay, okay. We'll get some stuff on the slide here. Uh, all right, so uh, if you go to the, the pickup website, uh, this is what you'll see on the main website on the front page. Um, so in here, there's exercise sets, and so this is curricular materials, and these curricular materials have uh, exercises that students can do. You can tailor these to, you can change these uh, to use in whatever way you see fit. There's also lots of supporting materials on there, um, as well as other things that I'd invite you to, to browse around and take a look at. If you go to the exercise sets page, you'll see a list of a bunch of exercise sets. Uh, and inside here, you can uh, look at and filter by what course you're interested in, what level you're interested in, the different programming languages that it has implementations for. So this isn't something for just a single programming language. We're, we're happy to support whatever it is uh, people want to use in their courses, um, whether that be Python or MATLAB or Mathematica or Excel. Um, any of those, we're perfectly happy to, to have people use. Um, I'm gonna show you an example of one exercise set in particular. Um, so I'll show you one that, that's actually one of mine. Um, so uh, this exercise set right here uh, is Charges in a Conductor in Gauss's Law. If you wanna look for that particular title, you can find that under the exercise sets page. Uh, every exercise set has the same uh, series of stuff. So under the title, there's a brief description that you'll see. Uh, and then there's also some metadata here. Uh, every one of these has a list of learning objectives of what a student should be able to do after completing this. Uh, for this one, you can see there's lots of available implementations. So the code for this is available in lots of different programming languages. And then if you look at those tabs that are down at the bottom of this slide, you'll see uh, there's the instructor's guide, which is just sort of talking to a potential adopter. Um, there's the actual exercises, and then there's lots of other supporting material. Uh, what this particular exercise set actually does is simulates if you have a bunch of charges inside of a conducting volume, and then just let them interact with one another by Coulomb's law. They're all going to push apart on each other and end up on the surface of the conductor um, and eventually uh, get to where they're in their equilibrium position. And uh, you get the magical effect that in the middle, uh, the electric field is zero everywhere inside the conductor. And students can actually uh, do this experimentally with a computational experiment and see that the superposition of all of the electric fields does give you zero. Uh, this particular uh, implementation that I'm showing right here, this is in vPython, um, so you can see the, the three-dimensional uh, nature of this. This is something that I actually have students do in the introductory electricity and magnetism lab uh, using GlowScript. Um, so this is uh, written for them that the charges push on each other and exert forces, but then they write the code to actually compute the net electric field and analyze the results. Uh, on the website, ways that you can get involved is you can become a verified educator. Um, so in order to access all of the materials, uh, you just need to prove that you are actually an educator and not a student who's trying to cheat on something that might be assigned to them. Um, and that's completely free. You just need to put in a website to show uh, that we can verify that you're an educator. Uh, you can join the Slack team, which is an online discussion tool. Uh, you can also become an author and a reviewer. So the pickup materials, that they're actually peer reviewed. We have a peer review editorial process. Um, so you can submit exercise sets that you author. Um, you can also become a reviewer. So the exercise sets go up for peer review. And there's an editor that handles this. 
um, in a usual peer reviewed kind of process. Uh, I just mentioned verified educators. This is a plot showing how many verified educators and how many Slack members we have as a function of time. Um, so we, we first had our, our first workshops in the summer of 2016. So in both of these curves, that's where you see them start to go up there. Um, this is actually, I made this plot this past summer and the, the latest numbers on here, uh, we're right at a thousand verified educators right now. Um, and this is pretty good when you think of this as being actually each of these people is a physics teacher. Um, so there, there are not billions of those people out there, right? So this is a, a decent fraction of physics teachers um, that are, are interested in and starting to use the pickup materials. This is where those verified educators are actually located around the United States. Um, so they're spread out uh, all over the place. Uh, and this is in the world. So in addition to the United States, uh, there's a fair amount uh, in Europe as well as a smattering elsewhere in the world. Uh, so that was a little bit about pickup. Um, so the next thing is going to be, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the sophomore level computational course uh, that I'm teaching right now and, and have taught several times uh, in past years also. Um, Scott, should I continue on to this? Yes, indeed. Uh, okay. But if anyone has questions, go ahead and uh, post them to the chat session while uh, Larry continues. Okay, great. Um, so j before I get started into that course, let me just tell you a little bit about Francis Marion University, which is where I'm at. So inside of our department, any student who majors in physics uh, either needs to have a concentration in, in health physics or in computational physics. Uh, so those are our physics majors. We also have uh, students who are doing various different types of engineering. So we have an engineering technology program in coordination with the local uh, technical local technical colleges. Um, we also have a 3-2 program. We have free engineering. And then in recent years, we've started our first bachelor's degrees in engineering, in industrial engineering, and we're also just starting in mechanical engineering. Uh, the reason for pointing this out is all of these students are required to take this sophomore level computational class. So these are physics majors, engineering majors, as well as engineering technology, pre-engineering, um, and they're all in, in that course. So uh, this course, uh, Physics 220 is the course number, and the title is Computational Methods for Physics and Engineering. Um, again, it's required for all of our majors, uh, and it's taken ideally in the fall of their sophomore year, uh, is when they take it during, during their overall uh, schedule. Uh, in this course, students need to do some programming. Uh, there's an introduction to numerical methods, and they solve problems both numerically using the computer and symbolically using the computer. And then I'm going to show you some, uh, some things that I've just copied and pasted from my syllabus for this course. So these are here's a list of topics for the course. Um, and each of these topics listed right here, that is an assignment, uh, a weekly assignment that they get. Um, in addition to uh, there being a one-for-one, one, each line being an assignment, um, they actually have a couple of assignments dealing with uh, solving ODEs. Um, so that's one that gets a little bit of extra emphasis. Uh, but it's sort of the standard kind of things that you would expect in uh, an introductory level computational physics course. Uh, this is using Python and using Jupyter Notebooks, and they submit their assignments using Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, so what I'm going to tell you a little bit more about in terms of this course is uh, how their assignments work, how the grading works. In particular, I'm using specification grading and some of the instructional methods for this. So for their assignments, they have these weekly assignments that they submit as a report in a Jupyter notebook. Um, if you're not familiar with what a Jupyter notebook is, uh, it's like a Mathematica or Maple notebook that inside of it, uh, it, you put code, and the code will execute and produce results, but you also can have uh, text and other things inside there to make a nice report. Uh, in addition to those weekly assignments, uh, they also have uh, what I would call PCPCs, or pre-class progress checks, that are due more often, um, and that's to make sure that they're working on things outside of class. So the most common PCPC is to have them submit their progress uh, getting started on an assignment, or it might be that they have a reading assignment that they need to post something about the reading assignment. Um, so that's the assignments that they have. And then for those weekly assignments, uh, this semester, and this is actually the first time I'm doing this in this course, uh, but I'm happy with how it's going so far, is uh, I'm using what's referred to as specification grading. 
So for the specification grading, in order for them to pass an assignment, they need to actually do uh, all of these things, and each of these things needs to be done well. So here's a list of the 10 criteria that they need to meet in order for them to pass an assignment. Uh, and if, if they don't, then they don't pass. And there isn't actually any grading of the assignment other than pass or not pass. Um, so I don't need to come up with a score of is this 60% or is this 50%. It's either pass or not pass. Uh, for a little bit more detail about these 10 criteria, um, and this is also uh, what, I, what I give to them in the syllabus, is uh, so number one, number two, being complete and well-written to be kind of clear what that means, but I give the students a little bit more description uh, of what it means to be complete and what it means to be well-written. And the same thing with each of those other uh, items, numbers three through 10, uh, I give them some additional description about that. So for each of these specific parts, like the abstract, introduction, uh, the code, et cetera, um, the, their, their submission needs to have these things. Um, it needs to have each of those sections. It needs to have code that's reasonable, that runs correctly. They need to have results, and the results must be presented well. Um, and here's the last few things. So they should uh, discuss their results, and they should try to do a little bit of experimenting. Um, and if they do all of these things, and all of these things are, are done well, um, then they pass for a given assignment. Um, and then in terms of how this affects their final grade, as long as they pass all of their assignments, um, then they get full credit. Uh, if they don't pass a given submission, they do have a chance to resubmit. Um, and they resubmit uh, and pass, they'll get full credit for that. And I also built in a little bonus and penalty for passing on the first chance. They get a little extra credit bonus. Uh, if they don't pass on the first attempt, they get a little penalty um, from their final grade. So this is how the specification grading uh, is working. And then the last thing I'll mention briefly is the instructional methods uh, that I'm using. And this is in particular, uh, what do we actually do during the class time for this course? And basically, it's these three things is how class time is spent. Uh, so the first thing, uh, monkey see, monkey do, I actually got that phrase from uh, Hunter Close likes to use that term. So what this is, is where I stand at a computer at the front of the room and talk with them while typing out uh, uh, some code from scratch and they type it out on their computers, and they fix any bugs while they go along, and they ask questions as they go along. And in particular, use this to introduce something new. So for new programming methods, new syntax, new functions, that they really need something to be shown this, we do this part, uh, which this is analogous to traditional lecturing. This is the instructor delivering to the students. Um, and then the other two things, the pair programming and the group work, this is uh, more active learning uh, type things. So for the pair programming, uh, this is where it, it needs to be something that they are able, they know something about it um, to be able to make progress on it. So it's once they've been shown something new, now they're applying that new thing to solve some new problem. Um, and this is actually the first semester that I've been using pair programming. I've been happy with how that's been working. Um, in each group of two people, one person is the driver and one person is the navigator. And every three minutes, uh, they need to switch. So I'll set a timer for three minutes. And after three minutes, tell them to swap the driver and the navigator. Uh, this is something that apparently is pretty popular in uh, computer science uh, teaching. Um, I found out about this from Michelle Pichera, who's a, a pickup person um, who's been doing pair programming for a while. Um, and then the third thing here on this list is group work with whiteboards. So this is something where uh, it's, it's particularly useful when they're coming up with ideas and figuring out how the structure of something is supposed to work. So in particular, when they've been presented with an assignment and they need to figure out the structure or the pseudocode of how the assignment is supposed to be laid out, um, they'll get into groups with whiteboard, whiteboards, they'll come up with ideas, they'll write things down, they'll present to other groups, um, in order to figure out the overall structure of, of how their assignment is going to work in terms of the code. Um, for one recent example of that, uh, they had a recent assignment doing a Monte Carlo simulation of nuclear decay. Um, so for this assignment, the uh, monkey see, monkey do part, I showed them how to generate random numbers and how you can use an if statement to have the random number make something happen with a certain probability. And then uh, they did pair programming in order to simulate flipping multiple coins multiple times. Um, and then after they did that, then they came up with the algorithm for nuclear decay, uh, doing this in groups with the whiteboards. 
Um, so this is sort of the progress of me showing them something and then them in groups doing something analogous to what the assignment is. And then uh, with the whiteboards, they come up with what the process should be, what the overall structure should be um, to actually implement the assignment. Um, and then when it comes to actually doing the assignment, those that, that they do individually, they individually code the assignments. Um, and then in terms of how all of this counts towards the, the grading for this course, most of their grade is those weekly assignments that they submit in Jupyter Notebooks. Um, and then they get a little bit of credit for the other things, um, which is small. And then they have a midterm and a final, which is the rest of their grade. So those are the bigger things uh, in terms of their overall grade. So uh, that was um, a little bit about pickup and a little bit about this particular course. Um, so I will stop there. Well, thank you, Larry. Uh, in order to make sure we give both of our presenters time, we'll, we'll move ahead quickly. But since there were two written questions, I think we can get through them quickly. And then we'll go on to Richard. Uh, first, I think is related to pickup. Who pays for which workshop expenses and did NSF supplement to take growth into account? So, uh, thanks. The, the expenses of the workshops were entirely covered uh, by the NSF. And in particular, the growth was able to be handled primarily because the location that we had those workshops uh, in River Falls, Wisconsin, is dirt cheap. Um, so we had the workshop somewhere that is much less expensive than what we budgeted for having it in a more urban spot, um, which has allowed us to have the bigger groups. Um, and then there's been a, a registration fee um, this most recent year, which also helps towards that. But um, yeah, having it at an in inexpensive location has, has been huge. But by all expenses, does that include travel, point-to-point -point travel? The point-to-point -point travel is the one thing that doesn't get uh, entirely covered. People need to be able to get to the Minneapolis-St. Paul airport, um, and then we'll get them from there, and then uh, all of the room and board and uh, conference facilities is all taken care of. Okay, so that's... Um, we, we have offered some uh, travel scholarships to people who uh, demonstrate need. The second question, I think, relates to what you're doing in your own classroom. And the question was, do students read the specifications? Uh, good question. I try to encourage them to. Um, so you mean, even though I list it for them, do they pay attention to that, right? Is that, is that the question? I believe that's the question. Yeah. Um, so when they submit something that uh, is crap and, and doesn't do the things that, that uh, it says that they're supposed to do, um, I will give feedback um, in our course management system um, and say, you didn't do this and this and this. Um, and then in the next class, I will tell them, hey, be sure to, be sure to look at those. They need to do these things. Uh, but yes, not surprisingly, uh, they don't read that as well as we might hope that they would. Very good. Uh, if others have questions, feel free to add them to the chat space. Uh, and then after Richard's presentation, we'll open up to both written and uh, verbal questions. Richard, uh, let's turn to you now. Okay, let me see if I can successfully share the screen. Yes, indeed. Okay, uh, good. So uh, I want to talk to you about how we incorporate um, computation into our undergraduate physics curriculum. And what I'm going to say really applies exclusively uh, to our majors uh, or students who are taking our majors course um, and not, for instance, our, uh, our service courses. Um, so um, I guess I want to start by talking a little bit about uh, my philosophy of computation, which is in a word that I think it should be transformative. And so I want to teach the students how to use computation largely to explore new problems or to shine new light on old problems and not just to do the same old problem slightly better. And I also think computation offers a really powerful way to shorten the path from sort of undergraduate problems to problems that are really of current interest and thus we can really empower students this way. Um, and I'll show an example of this uh, in a minute, but I think that computation can also really help uh, students build an intuition that is very difficult to build uh, really any other way. 
Um, and I want to be able to do uh, use computation to do hard problems. And there's some trade-offs there, which I'll um, discuss a little later. Um, so how do we teach them computation? Well, um, some of it's done formally in a computational physics class, but we also slip it into the curriculum um, in a number of ways. So we can do this um, sort of in class as a computational demo for something where uh, we don't have a good physical demo uh, for whatever reason. Um, we can ask them to do some homework problems that involve computation, um, and we do that. Um, and we also use, make heavy use of computation in labs, starting with our first year students. Um, we start actually, their first three labs are really just an introduction to Mathematica. And then in not all, but most of the labs after that, um, they use Mathematica uh, as an analysis tool or to process data. Uh, so, for instance, they do in the second semester a lab where they um, push a cart on an air track, and that cart has a, um, a quartz oscillator on it, which makes a very annoying noise, uh, and they record that, um, and then they take a fast Fourier transform of the signal to fish the frequency out, and they can, by measuring the frequency shift, then measure the velocity of the cart, which they also confirm with uh, an ultrasonic ranger. Um, then we teach a few labs um, in the second year course that are purely computational. Most of their labs are physical labs, but we do have some where they just do computation, and I'll show an example of that in a minute. And then we teach, but not every year, um, chiefly because we don't have enough people who can teach computational physics. Uh, we also teach a computational physics class. This is a not a required class, but it's um, an elective. It always gets good enrollment, though, uh, when it is an elective, uh, mostly from physics students, but also from engineers who are looking to pick up a minor in physics. And this is typically taught at the uh, junior-senior level. Uh, so let me give you some examples, um, but before I do that, right, one of the things I really want to teach, as opposed to just algorithms of, you know, how do I do this integral numerically, I want to teach good computational habits. Okay? Uh, so I want to teach them when they should compute something and when they shouldn't, right? And what should they compute? And is what is the model they're solving right? And you know, how right is it? And is the result correct? And how accurate is it? And okay, uh, this is something that Bob Panoff uh, always emphasizes, and that's to think about the time to science. Okay? You don't want to spend six months rewriting your code to run on a GPU if you're only going to do it once and the code only takes a month to write, to run. Um, so I want them to be even though in a computational physics course, they're not really going to do something that takes that long, I want them to start thinking about those things. Uh, I find this is much harder than teaching them any you know, little bit of programming or, or an algorithm. Okay? So the first example is kind of a simple um, example that I use in class in our sophomore uh, course when we talk about, start talking about Fourier series, and that's just to write a little computer program. Um, and I often do this on the fly in front of them um, and then post the results uh, showing right, the results of Fourier analysis and how we can actually sum up waves you know, uh, to make a more complicated wave in the hope that they will then right, actually believe this. Okay. Uh, the second example, and then they have to do some of this on their own as well, of course. The second example um, comes from a computational lab that we do in the second semester of the sophomore course when we're doing quantum mechanics. Um, and we do 
after we've done the standard infinite square well, and we've done a simple harmonic oscillator, and we've done a finite square well, then in the lab, uh, we learn how to solve for bound states numerically by eigenfunction expansion. And we look at this asymmetric well here, okay? uh, and I'm showing you the first uh, three states. So the ground state is the blue line here, and the first excited state is the green line, and then up here the red is the second excited state, and the probability densities are then coded the same way uh, so that we see the third, third state is in red here, and they can, we can flip back and forth between the wave function and the probability density here. Um, so this gives us an opportunity with this asymmetric well to talk about, well, why is it that I'm so much more likely to find the particle on the right-hand side of the well in the ground state, okay? And why am I more likely to find it actually on the left-hand side of the well in the first excited state? And what is the, <coughs> excuse me, uh, if I think about this in terms of the average kinetic and potential energies of the particle in the left and right hand side of the well, can I really understand this and does this make sense? And then we can talk about as I move up in energy and we see that the wave function is now much more symmetric because it's no longer very sensitive to these low energy bumps and it really just cares about the sides of the well which are symmetric. Uh, and so we can do a bunch of, um, a, of examples like this, um, and that really helps them develop an intuition for quantum wells and quantum mechanics uh, that would have been very hard to do when I was a student. And then in a computational physics class, when I teach it, we actually redo this problem um, and we make it run on a GPU. Uh, where we can change the well interactively just by picking it up and moving it with your mouse and seeing the wave functions uh, recompute. So we do this as our sort of final GPU programming example. Um, okay. uh, and then I want to show them that you can do really hard problems. Um, so this is an example that you can think of um, kind of as a workup for doing core shell nanowires. Uh, and I just drew a, a picture of this nanostructure, right, which I just drew crudely on my, uh, on a whiteboard, okay. Uh, and then we go in and we pick off the boundary regions, uh, both the outer and inner boundary regions, and then um, we generate, we use uh, Mathematica's high-level mesh generating functions. Once we have these two regions, to generate the mesh, uh, and I don't know if you're going to be able to see it easily, but uh, the mesh has been refined around the boundary. Uh, <coughs> we use, once again, some high-level functions in Mathematica to detect where we need to refine the mesh. We can then go ahead and solve this using finite elements, um, which we've already talked about in the course, well, which we've talked about concurrently with this. Uh, and then we can go ahead and, and find the, uh, what I'm showing you here, the first four, uh, the probability densities for the first four states. Um, and then we can talk about the physics and do we believe this in terms of the approximate symmetry of the problem and so forth. Um, now, there are trade-offs here. So my sort of course philosophy for computational physics is I'm going to use a high level language. I'm going to make them prove that their code works. I'm going to try to make them understand the accuracy of the calculation. And we do this basically by doing what I would call numerical analysis by pictures. If I find the mesh up and redo the calculation, what changes? Okay. I want them to think about how algorithms scale. Okay. If I can do this for n equals four, how long is it going to take it if n is 16? Okay. And I want them to understand that they can actually do really hard problems. Okay. But 
the trade-off here is I have to neglect some things, okay? I don't talk anything about how computers represent numbers. I don't really talk much about the theory of error propagation. When we're concerned about errors, we do it with pictures. Find the mesh up, coarsen the mesh up, what changes, okay? Use fewer or more points in a numerical algorithm. How does that scale, okay? And actually, um, I neglect some of the basic algorithms that would be traditionally taught in the course. Um, and I really don't feel that the choice of topics matters a whole lot. They should be connected to physics, um, but you can't cover everything. And teaching sort of good basic computational skills and computational thinking is, in my mind, more important than the algorithm. Um, and so there's always this balance. How much time am I going to spend teaching just pure computation? So if you do something on a GPU, okay, there's a lot of nitty gritty computer science there. Okay? Versus how much time am I going to use, spend using computation to teach physics? And this is partly a question of low level language versus high level. And then speed versus computation. It runs faster in native C than Mathematica, but native C is gonna be harder to read, okay? And I want to do hard problems, but I also, you know, don't want to be a complete black box where they don't understand uh, what's going on. So I always want them to think about checking and validating the result. Um, and so that's kind of an overview of, right, of sort of our approach to computation in the uh, curriculum. And we have a number of challenges. Um, you know, as faculty members who've done this retire, you have to get the newer faculty members to right, believe that they should ask their students problems that require computation. And there's always a question of languages. The astrophysicists um, like Python, and in fact, they use Jupyter Notebooks in the um, astrophysics class. Um, the theoretical physicists all like Mathematica. Uh, if you're gonna switch the labs, you have to spend a lot of time rewriting labs and so forth. So there are always a number of, uh, of challenges and I would not want to claim that the way we do it, right, is sort of the right way or the only way. Um, I do think that students need to see computation throughout their uh, curriculum or they simply forget it or, you know, write it off as something they don't really have to care about. Uh, and with that, I'd like to turn it over to Scott to mediate questions. And I think I need to unshare my screen. Probably. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. Uh, we'll now, uh, of course, open it up if people want to either uh, write questions or ask questions verbally. I encourage you to do so. This is Bob Panos. I, I want to start by claiming the right to make a congratulatory comment as a proud uncle or grandfather for this project. When Scott and I hosted the first pickup meetings back before I think it even had the name pickup uh, with Norm and Richard and, and, and others, uh, the, the three characteristics that make this a successful model for other domains is the fact that there was persistence in trying to get the project going and get it funded. The number of times the proposal had to be written and rewritten and resubmitted uh, in spite of oscillating comments from reviewers, uh, you should be commended and be very proud of that as I am proud of you, if you'll let me be proud of you. Uh, the other was the broad net of people, that it wasn't all upper level, it wasn't all introductory, it wasn't all gen ed, but you've sort of addressed problems across the levels of instruction and content and also the kinds of institutions. Uh, small institutions, uh, liberal arts institutions, research institutions are all participating and that's something which uh, I, I certainly take a lot of pride in seeing your success in doing this 
uh, given how many other projects have attempted and not yet att attained that. So that's my comment. My question uh, is, is really in the form of a comment, and that is I've been spending most of my last year and a half thinking about gen ed courses in which physics is one example of a science, but also the effect of computational physics instruction on getting physics students to understand the analogy of physics in other domains. You know, what you have is equal to what you had plus what changed. You know, this in the same way that we solve computational problems like where you are is where you were plus how far you moved, you know, it's the number of rabbits that you have is the number of rabbits that you had plus the change in the number of rabbits. So trying to stimulate the thinking of the physics students, since so many of our physics students don't necessarily stay in physics, but they take what they've learned and apply it to other domains. And so um, I'm wondering to what extent do your physics classes, uh, do you have a gen ed class at your institutions and can you take advantage of that to bring students into physics and to send students out of physics into more other domains? Uh, so I'll take a, well, I'll say a couple uh, words about that. Um, so we're unusual in that about 70% of our students go on to graduate school in physics, um, mostly for PhDs. Um, our students who go into industry jobs, um, I must say, and those who go into high school jobs uh, do appreciate the computational skills that we've taught them. Um, and those that go into high school teaching um, often, you know, use computational demos. Uh, in terms of gen ed courses, um, the, well, let me just say that the instructors who are teaching those gen ed courses are perhaps not the most computationally friendly ins instructors, and this would propose, this would, uh, pose a real challenge for us, I think. Yeah, if, so if you have the right person, um, I, one person that, that's a good example of this is uh, Walter Freeman at Syracuse University, um, who's an enthusiastic pickup person. Um, so in his gen ed courses, in particular, uh, a gen ed astronomy, um, he makes pretty heavy use of computation um, using GlowScript. Um, so yeah, I think that's a, a good opportunity there. Um, and also there's a lot of interest in this from the, uh, the Introductory Physics for Life Science community, or IPLS, um, with their new Living Physics Portal, um, that I think people in terms of uh, physics for life scientists, um, there's going to be more recognition of the usefulness of computation. Um, and I think there's going to be more of that coming. Um, so yeah, I, I agree and I think it's, it's slowly on its way. I don't know if you're looking at the, the chat space, but there's a question, what sort of computational background do US first year students have these days? Uh, well, once again, I'll say a word or two. Um, it's poor. Um, in fact, um, I believe that it has gotten worse. Um, and we have recently had students who, because they have never used anything other than a smartphone or a tablet, I uh, do not know how to navigate a file system and did not know that they needed to save their work. Uh, because of course on a tablet you don't or on a phone. Um, so I think it's the computational background is worse this now, at least for our students, than it was, you know, five years ago. Do you provide a computational lab space or do they do it on their own, bring your own device? Uh, we provide a computational lab space, um, which they have access to, uh, you know, 24 uh, seven, but they can also use their own device. Although we do not guarantee tech support for their own device, although we try to provide it when possible. The, the question before about the computational background for first year students, um, I would agree, but offer a little bit of optimism that, so students have, have gotten worse in terms of their computational skills than they were 
decades ago because one doesn't actually need computational skills in order to get to your email or Facebook or whatever it is, right? Whereas before, in order to operate a computer, you actually needed to know something uh, because it was harder to do. Uh, but I have two um, fairly young children um, in elementary school, and they have been doing um, the hour of code um, has been a, a, a thing that's been going on for, for kids where they actually do some computer science. They do some, some basic programming at a young age. So I have my fingers crossed that when kids who are that age get to be entering college, perhaps things will improve a little. So another question. Uh, I started my position this fall. I'll be teaching introduction to computational physics for the first time. Do you have suggestions, resources for preparing the course? But well, uh, one easy answer to that is go to the pickup website um, and you'll see lots of lots of materials there that you can uh, download and be inspired by and tailor to um, fit whatever purposes you need them to fit. So I would say that I think you need to decide what language you're going to use. And if possible, you should use a textbook because even if you don't follow the textbook that closely because students like a textbook, it provides uh, comfort for them, at least psychologically. Um, and of course, what textbook you're going to use and how closely you're going to follow it is going to depend to a large extent on what language you decide you're going to use. What language are you thinking about? Python. Oh, well, so there are, of course, a bunch of good, um, there are a bunch of good textbooks for Python, and there are um, a number of good online tutorials as well, um, including, for example, the LIGO tutorials, where they let you, uh, where they teach you how to fish out a gravitational wave event uh, from their background. So Richard, maybe I could uh, ask you to send me a list of those textbooks you might recommend we can send out to the group. Uh, I will do so and I'll make a note to myself right now so that I don't forget. So I'll uh, ask everyone if you want that or other information, be sure to send your email to me, lathrop at illinois.edu. Yeah, included in the question are there open textbooks for these types of courses? For, uh, yeah, I believe many of them are open, actually. I would, I would recommend, if you're going to have a textbook for the intro level and, and using Python, um, the Kinder and Nelson book, uh, the title is A Student's Guide to Python for Physical Modeling, um, is a, a good, not horribly expensive um, intro level book. Um, uh, Jake Vanderplas, I think is how you pronounce his name, um, has lots of materials that are online, including a, a free um, textbook um, in the, that's in a Jupyter notebook format. So Larry, maybe you can either put in the chat space or send it to me and I'll forward to everyone who sends me their email. <laughs> sure. um, I, I have a generic question too. Um, commercial software versus free software, what are your recommendations? Well, so I talked about uh, something that's that's free, and Richard talked about something that's commercial, right? Right. Uh, right. And in fact, in the department, we use, I mean, people use C, they use Python, they use Mathematica. Um, so this is, in our case, we, we have a Mathematica site license. Uh, so it's quite inexpensive for students to put Mathematica on their computers. If that were not true, uh, I think that might change my calculation. It's no good teaching someone something that they can't afford to use. Right. right. So we, we've been advocating in some cases, especially for smaller and under-resourced schools, that they look at sage math. Uh, there are certain things in spreadsheets that Google spreadsheets can be used in place of Excel, but Google spreadsheets and other open source spreadsheets don't iterate correctly. If you want to solve for an iterative solution, Excel allows that and the other ones don't. 
so there are some limitations with the free, but it depends on what you're teaching and what the examples are. Uh, but we, we we're finding that some schools are able to get by with Sage Math instead of Mathematica. It's a little more clunky, but it, it's a it's accessible. I, I wanted to get back to something which I think. Richard started to touch upon, uh, and that is, how does bringing computation into the curriculum help students either go deeper or learn more or expand their knowledge base that they otherwise would not have been able to uh, accomplish without computation? C can you talk about that aspect? Uh, so to, I'll just kick things off. I think that one of the real strengths of computation is the ability to really build your intuition by doing a bunch of cases um, relatively quickly and by being able to easily visualize the results. Um, so I didn't show it, but we also do a computational lab on uh, wave packet scattering. Um, and this is a case where students can build an intuition that just is not possible without doing computation. And it also allows us actually to look at um, two recent um, problems of kind of research interest. Uh, and one is, wait, is how you split a wave packet. Um, this is uh, theoretically the work is about 10 years old and the uh, first experiments in Bose-Einstein condensates were done about five years ago. Um, and then we also look at something called paradoxical reflection, which is kind of the opposite of tunneling, it's where a particle um, isn't where it's supposed to be. Uh, and so you can actually watch a particle not fall off a cliff. Um, and this is even more recent, and it's not hard to do numerically, uh, but this is, uh, you know, just something that you couldn't do uh, without significant computation. If, if I could modify the question a little, to what extent in the course, do your students pick problems themselves, or is it all assignment-based learning? Oh, I, uh, I require them to do a, a project, um, which they are supposed to be working on throughout the semester. Um, they can pick um, within very broad limits anything they like, although I have to approve it to make sure that it's not trivial or in the much more common case, simply way too hard and ambitious for a semester. Um, but everybody has to do a project of their uh, own choosing. Uh, and these have ranged, uh, well, uh, all over the place from uh, financial calculations to a woman who was interested in biology who uh, modeled a membrane of a, of a frog. I would, have, I would have a similar answer. Um, in particular, I would echo the um, too easy or too hard and most commonly too hard uh, that for the last two weeks of the semester in, in the course that I have right now, um, the students are going to be for their last assignment, they pick what it is that they're doing. Um, and so they've been submitting their ideas of what they think they want to do. And by far, the most common problem is, yeah, that's going to be too hard. Um, how, are, how are you actually going to do that? It's at the level of, yes, you could do that, but then we'd have to give you a Nobel Prize. <laughs> you know. Or at least a PhD. So there's another question. Is there any introduction to or discussion of high-performance computing concepts or systems? Uh, so the last time I taught the computational physics course, we ran some code on GPUs. Uh, and we also ran some on... Um, a cluster at uh, the Ohio Supercomputer Center. Uh, they were uh, extraordinarily, um, you know, cooperative and, in fact, eager in terms of uh, of getting accounts for the students and uh, making sure that their jobs weren't stuck in queues and so on. Um, and uh, they were just a real pleasure to work with. So, since you mentioned that, I, I guess I should put in a, a short ad saying that 
through Blue Waters or Exceed for a U.S. Uh, faculty, you can get education accounts quickly and easily should you need HBC resources to teach some concepts. For me, uh, in the, the sophomore level course, um, we do not do any uh, HPC. Um, I mean, the one thing that we do is we certainly do some timing of computation time. Um, and since it's in Python, uh, do introduce Numba, which is a just-in-time compiler for Python, um, to be able to show that, hey, if you compile, you can actually speed this up a lot. But then we also do have an upper-level course titled Advanced Computational Physics. Um, and in there, they do some high-performance computing. So I know we're approaching the top of the hour, and I don't know what our uh, two presenters' schedule is like. Um, we'll, we'll go as long as you two are available, or either of you. But for the rest of you, um, if any of you are actively involved in teaching uh, computational physics and would like to share in a future webinar, please let me know. Uh, the session will be recorded, so if you or colleagues want to play this back or you want to share this with others you know, uh, we'll send you the link for that. Uh, and if there's topics you want to discuss in the future, please do share those ideas and suggestions. Meantime, uh, Larry and Richard, it's up to you as long as you need or want. We'll keep going. Otherwise, we'll, we'll close when you have to go. Well, I'd just be interested in asking uh, for, for VJ, who said that uh, you were going to be teaching this computational physics course for the first time. Um, can you tell us a, a little bit about what you have in mind for, for how it's going to work? VJ, do you have audio? Hello, everybody. So, um, I'm going to be teaching at uh, North Carolina a and State University. This is the first time I'm teaching this course. Um, I was going to use, uh, you know, the book, as you suggested, uh, by Phil Nelson. Um, I know Phil Nelson very well, so he had recommended me that book about Python. Um, and then I have had my computational physics training in India, where I, you know, it was the old school way of doing things. So we, yeah, we did do how numbers are represented on a computer and um, you know, going through the regular algorithms of uh, like, um, you know, how do you solve a first order differential equation and things like that. So I was going to incorporate those basic things the way I have learned, uh, at least in the first version. Um, and then I wanted to definitely have a project uh, in my in my course, so student would be working for at least um, the you know the the later part of the semester on the project, and I wanted to include some some problems from biological physics. So my research is in biological physics, and I I have seen again from Phil Nelson uh, lots of projects where you can simulate you know um, molecular um, molecular reactions or how you know how bacteria bind to things so i was going to include some of them as either projects or assignments um, i don't know how much of that is really physics and whether people would be interested in doing that but it's something which i like so i think i could incorporate that that's my overall plan right now and what level is this course this is going to be the Sophomore level course, yes, 300, 300 sophomore level course. So VJ, this is Bob Pano from Shodor. We're just up the road in Durham. Uh, oh, there'll be a physics workshop this Saturday at the North Carolina School of Science and Math as part of the North Carolina AAPT chapter meeting. Uh, but I could easily pop over and visit sometime. It'd be good to have a conversation about what we could be doing to do this at least here in North and also South Carolina. Okay. Should I send you an email? Sure. That would probably be the easiest. I'll, I'll put it in the chat window. Okay. Thank you. So this is Richard Gass. So the one piece of advice I would have for you is make your students choose their projects early. Okay. That way there's, the hope that they'll start working on them before it's too late. And yeah, using what uh, Larry had talked about, I would recommend.
progress reports on the on the projects you know require them to you know halfway through the semester give you something you know or a weekly update on what their progress is so it's not everybody trying to do this at the last minute yeah i was i was planning to do something like that so there would have been uh, you know one of the assignment would have simply been you know your writer abstract discuss with me what your project is and uh, like you know the time when you have the second mid semester uh, i would have asked them to give me like an interim report and then a final presentation um, i was also thinking of making them do in pairs so not individually and what do you think about that is that a good idea or a bad idea so i haven't had any experience with having pairs for something that gets submitted as an assignment or a project um so during class time i use pair programming which i like um i don't really i i don't yeah i don't know yeah i also have always had students do the projects individually um at least in computational physics although an advanced lab i have had them do projects um in groups, um, so I don't have a strong opinion. I, I've been teaching two different levels of computational science. One is a modeling and simulation course, which is across disciplines, and the other is a scientific investigations using computation, which is the gen ed course. And part of the evaluation is an oral presentation and written presentation, and having them work in groups of two or three allows you to get a math, a computer science, and a science students working together, but they have to individually do their write-up. But the oral presentation could be group, and that minimizes, since that's part of it and takes up class time, the fewer projects there are, the more likely they are to be better presentations. So it, it's just style, whatever fits what you're trying to teach. I also require a, um, pro uh, an oral presentation for the project, and I set a hard time limit uh, for them, and I find that having a hard time limit, which depending on class size is typically 10 to 15 minutes, um, actually results in much better presentations. I, I have one more question. Um, so the students that I am I'm going to get, um, at least people have warned me that that um, they don't have very good um, math skills or or computational skills. I mean, these are these are um, and these students really struggle with even basic maths and basic physics. Um, so you know, as, as you know, you were, you were saying earlier that you, you really skip things like, um, um, you know, how, how a number is represented on computers and, and those basic ideas. But I don't think, you know, I, I would be able to skip those. And, and what are the, so, so what are the, what are the things that one should emphasize on while working with students who are, um, to put it mildly, very weak in, in maths and computers? So I would uh, give the suggestion slash warning that whenever you have a choice between uh, making something harder or making it easier, uh, go for easier, um, especially this, this first semester, to avoid the possibility of having students who are just horribly overwhelmed and frustrated and upset. Um, but in terms of representing numbers on a computer, you know, just the concept of assignment and what the assignment operator does when you say x equals 2.0 and then uh, the more challenging line of x equals x plus dx, um, that's something that's important for them to know and understand. And I'm not sure if this audience really needs more than that in terms of how that number gets stored inside the computer. Okay. Yeah, I would second Larry's uh, suggestion that when in doubt, go with easier. Okay. Yes, this is Bob again. We stick with Euler type solutions for a lot of things, but understanding 
the x plus dx if the dx is not a fractional power of two, you know, and you know, there's at least one session, you know, one 75 minute class hands on exploration of numerical round off truncation resolution so they understand the limits of what the computer can and cannot do. You know, I mean, to understand that 500 million added to Avogadro's number doesn't change Avogadro's number, you know, is an important concept for helping them pick a project that is reasonable. Uh, but some very simple lessons on round off truncation and resolution. I find to be very helpful for the rest of the semester. Okay, thank you. I haven't seen any more written questions. Does anyone else on the call have any questions or suggestions or advice? Okay, I think we've probably reached uh, capacity for today. So uh, Larry and Richard, I want to thank you both very much. Uh, it's been a very good presentation by each of you and a good engagement of the audience. Um, we'll have to hopefully get some good feedback from the participants and uh, try to keep the uh, discussions going. Uh, I guess one last question. When is the next workshop that people might want to consider applying for? So. Uh, there is at the upcoming winter AAP team meeting for anyone going to that. Uh, there's pickup workshops there um, at the spring APS meetings. During the summer, we're actually having our pickup capstone conference, um, which so anyone who's attended any sort of workshop will be invited to that, including if you can make it to a workshop at an AAPT or APS meeting. So lots of opportunities coming up um, in the coming months. And then if there's any Carolinians, as I said, there'll be a workshop this coming Saturday at the North Carolina School of Science and Math on very introductory level gen ed quality uh, computational physics. So that's in Durham, North Carolina on Saturday morning. All right, then. Again, uh, thank you, Larry. Thank you, Richard. And thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, we'll uh, get this video posted as soon as we can and uh, look forward to seeing you in the future. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.